Well, we're going to continue our Easter series looking at Mark's Gospel, and Vicky's going to read for us now. I'm going to read Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to chapter 16, verse 8. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learnt from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was, Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, as we come to God's word, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God. We thank you for your word. And therefore, Father, please speak to us through your word, by your spirit. Help us to understand, to believe, and to live in the light of these wonderful verses, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Fear. It's an incredibly powerful emotion, isn't it? It drives probably a good percentage of what is going on in our country at the moment, whether it be the government's policies uh, in terms of allowing people to go on furlough and to be given wages to stop hardship, whether it be the money that's been uh, and all the different things that are happening with the NHS to try and allay people's fears. There is great fear ar ar around, isn't there, in our world and in our hearts too in many ways. Fear of the unknown, how is how is coronavirus going to affect us if we get it? But underneath all of the fear, I think lies one particular fear. And that is the fear of death. It is something of a taboo in our culture, isn't it? If we were able to get together and have people around for dinner and that kind of thing, if somebody brought up the topic of death, you'd, you'd, choke in your, you'd choke on your food slightly, wouldn't you? It's not something you normally bring up. And yet, we're having to talk about it as a culture, and it's making us deeply uncomfortable. The philosopher Pascal once said that we keep ourselves busy to, with, with distractions, so that we don't have to sit quietly and think about death. It was said that the court jester was the one that was kept closest to the king to stop the king thinking about death and his own mortality. But, it, but God has, hasn't he, in his own mysterious providence, taken away many of those distractions, giving us time to stop as a culture and to think. And what has been the result? Well, in many people, bewilderment, trembling, maybe even just in the quiet and real fear. I wonder if you felt that 
that wave of fear this week as Boris Johnson was taken into intensive care, the way that it, it hit the nation as the reality of our own mortality hit us again. We love the NHS, don't we? But despite it, hundreds if not thousands are going to die today. And so, on this Easter Sunday morning, rather than trying to bury our heads in the sand of distractions, is there a way to face life and even death without fear? Is it really possible to be sure of a world the world we all want on the other side of death without suffering, sin and death. With a loving creator God forever. To our culture that sounds like a pipe dream. But why is it that we want it so much? Well the Bible's answer is yes it is possible to face life and death without fear and with that kind of hope. Not on the basis of, of wishful thinking but on the basis of the historical facts of the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. It's a big claim, isn't it? We need to be certain that those things really happened. And so to face death without fear, we need to be crystal clear on the answer to three questions. The first is this. Did Jesus really die? Well, have a look at verse 42 with me. Let me read from verse 42. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, in other words, the Friday, the day that Jesus died. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he, he was already dead. That was unusual. People usually lasted days on a cross. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that, that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some of the linen cloth, took down the body and wrapped it in linen, probably with the help of his servants, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Do you see how that reads as evidence? So you see the centurion there, don't you? Who had already seen, just back in verse 39, he'd seen Jesus die. He'd seen the way that Jesus gave up his life. And so he certifies, verse 39, that he has seen Jesus die. He certifies it to Pilate. It was his job. Pilate says, Centurion, uh, is Jesus dead? And the centurion, with his job and his life on the line, says, yes. Yes, Jesus is dead. Jesus' body here is, is, turns, is taken down from the cross, isn't it, during the day, by Joseph of Arimathea. He's name-checked. This is, Mark's Gospel would have been written uh, within 20 or 30 years of these events happening. He would have still been around. Name-checking the eyewitnesses, the people involved in this. So Jesus is, is wrapped in linen, as was customary, and placed in a tomb that would already have been there. It was a rich man's tomb, probably Joseph's. And verse 47, two female witnesses see where Jesus' body was laid. And of course, famously, uh, women's testimony was were not permissible in court in the day. You'd only record it like this if it was true. Even secular historians of the time record the fact that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. Tacitus records, a Roman historian, that Jesus was executed while Pontius Pilate was the Roman prefect in charge of Judea between 26 and 36 AD. You see, no one then and no one now who seriously looks at the evidence denies that Jesus died. And that's important because the Bible says that we need Jesus to die. 
for us in our place. The Bible says that we have sinned against God, that we deserve his judgment. And as we saw on Easter Friday, on Good Friday, the only way in which we can be saved from God's judgment is if the Son of God dies in our place. And that's what happened. Jesus took the wrath of God that we deserve. He experienced hell for us, for his people. Jesus really did die. Without the cross, there is no hope. But if Jesus died, well, the second question then, crucially, is did Jesus rise again? Well, let's read from chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, in other words, it's now Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. They presumed that that hadn't already been done. It might well have been. Verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, that is the Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Imagine them walking in the crisp morning air, thinking about how they can roll a huge stone away. But verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. And wouldn't you be? Verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. And you can imagine the angel saying he is not here, pointing to the place where Jesus was. The tomb is empty. He has risen. But of course that is just as Jesus had said it would be, wasn't it? What did Jesus say to his disciples in the upper room days beforehand? Well, Mark 14 verse 28. Jesus says, yes, I'm going to be killed. But verse 28 of chapter 14, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And so the angel reminds the women, doesn't he? Verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. This is all according to plan. Now you might say, well, hold on. Surely this is all made up. Angels, stones being rolled away, dead people rising. Really? Really? Well, actually, when you start looking closely at this, you realise quite quickly that there is no better explanation for the empty tomb than the one we have in front of us. Because if the Romans had taken the body, well, the moment that people started claiming that Jesus was the Son of God who was alive, they would have produced the body. Same for the, the Jewish leaders, if they'd taken the body, if they'd taken the body and Jesus his disciples start going around saying Jesus is alive well they want to quash that fairly quickly the idea that he's the messiah they'd have produced the body and it would have been worth a huge amount of money for anyone who knew where the body was but there was no body there was no dead body and there is no actually there's no better explanation for the explosion of Christianity around the Middle East and therefore around the world. Because the body again would have been easily produced to squash that. You see, look into it, it checks out. Jesus really is alive. And that means that death has been defeated. Someone has gone through death and come out the other side and that means because of who he is that he can get us through death too and so firstly 
Jesus really did die. Secondly, Jesus really did rise again. And so thirdly, how can we face death without fear? How do you do it? Well, the answer is faith in Jesus. The end of Mark's gospel has puzzled many down the years because it ends in a, in a quite abrupt way, doesn't it? Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And many people uh, have thought, well, we need to add a little bit more to Mark's gospel to just kind of round it off a bit. But that's not original to Mark. No, Mark's gospel ends at verse 8 deliberately. But we leave the women and the disciples trembling in fear. The disciples in a room somewhere locked away and the women running away, from, running away in fear from the tomb. It's all too much. But only weeks later, those same people are standing in the middle of Jerusalem proclaiming loudly that the people of Jerusalem have killed the Lord of life, that Jesus really did die, that Jesus really did rise, that he really has ascended to heaven and one day he will return to judge the living and the dead and therefore that all need to turn and trust in him. They stand boldly and proclaim that. Just read Acts chapter 2 maybe later if you'd like. They proclaim the certain hope in life and in death that comes through faith in Jesus. And so I wonder if the ending of this gospel actually is designed to make us ask the question, what is our reaction to these events going to be? That he died, that he rose. Is it going to be fear? Fear because we don't understand what Jesus did? Well, have a read of Mark's gospel uh, all the way through. It will take you an hour or two. That will help you to understand what Jesus did. Perhaps you fear because you're not sure whether he really can save, whether he really can get you through death. Well, again, remember, this is eyewitness testimony. This happened. Mark read a bit earlier from 1 Corinthians 15. Maybe you read that. You see that you see the certainty that comes with trusting in Jesus, with the one who rose again from the dead. Maybe fear because we doubt that death really is defeated. <laughs> that it is really a, an enemy that has been defanged. It's weapons taken away. You see, we need not fear. We can instead have faith in Jesus and rejoice. If you're watching this morning and you're not yet trusting in Jesus... That is, you haven't yet turned from your sin and, and put your trust in Jesus to save you, to forgive you, and therefore live with Jesus as Lord. Can I invite you, can I plead with you to turn to Jesus this morning? You too can live without fear in life, with, even with coronavirus in your system, and live without fear in the face of death. That is possible because Jesus is coming back. To, wrong, to uh, raise all the dead and to take his people home. And therefore, if you haven't done that, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, please trust in Jesus this morning. And if you're already entrusting in Jesus, just rejoice this morning that it's true, that Jesus is coming back, that he will raise the dead, that he will judge, he will take his people to be in a renewed world, this world renewed, free from suffering, sin and death, forever with God we will see the face of Christ and we can be sure about that why because the tomb is empty because Jesus is alive and we therefore we can live out that confidence in the day to day in our in our homes and hopefully when we're let out other places too instead of being gripped by fear. Uh, in 18th century England, uh, there was a Christian leader called uh, John and Charles Wesley. Uh, and uh, 
that Wesley's, I think it was Charles, was chatting to uh, one of the doctors who was working with some people uh, in the area. And the doctor had recently watched a number of Christians, Bible-believing Christians, die. And the doctor said this uh, to uh, John Wesley, it was. Most people die for fear of dying. But I have never met with people such as yours, speaking of the Christians. They are none of them afraid of death but are calm and patient and resigned to the last. That is, they're trusting. What was John Wesley's reply? Yes. Our people die well. And in all the uncertainty, we too can have that kind of confidence in the face of uncertain lives and one day certain death by trusting and by continuing to trust in Jesus, the one who died and who rose. Let's have that confidence on this Easter morning. Let me lead us in a prayer. Father, we thank you that Jesus died for our sins in our place if we are trusting in Jesus. Thank you, Father, that Jesus rose again. He walked out of the tomb in victory on that Sunday morning. We thank you that because he is alive, we can be confident that one day we will be brought back, to, we will be brought into resurrection life one day when Jesus returns. And so, Father, please, with that confidence, shape every area of our lives and our thoughts today and for the rest of our days. And please, Father, help us uh, to live out that confidence in our relationships. Please give us a deep confidence, uh, even to share the good news about Jesus this morning with those who are around us. Please, Father, help us to be those who trust and to keep trusting in Jesus. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing about our hope in life and in death.